Excellent. Thank you. Um, I am Tina Cormier. I am a remote sensing scientist at Indigo Ag, and um, I'm not going to be talking about my specific work today, but what I want to talk to you about is um, how the geospatial community views R and how we use R and how R fits in with all the other tools that we use. Um, before I keep going, um, I have my Twitter handle up there and I also have, I put all the code behind um, the million bar charts you're about to see uh, <laughs> into GitHub and my presentation's there as well. Okay, so the first thing we need to get out of the way is that much like uh, many of you, geospatial data scientists are a very diverse group. Um, we do a lot of different things. Uh, we span many different sectors. So there's finance, there's people studying climate change, agriculture, that's what I do, um, telecommunications, transportation, social media, it kind of spans the whole gamut. And we don't use just one tool, and I'm sure that that, that sounds very familiar to a lot of you. Um, so what I kind of wanted to do was pull the community and figure out, you know, is my experience, I kind of know how I work, is my experience uh, sort of representative of what's going on in the broader geospatial community, or am I some sort of weirdo? Don't answer that. Uh, <laughs> um, so I created a poll, and I had it live for about a week or two, I don't know. Um, but basically, I asked a whole bunch of questions. Like, I put it out on Twitter, I sent it to my coworkers, previous coworkers, you know, anyone that I knew that um, works in geospatial. And I got a pretty good number back, 307. Doesn't qualify me for the big data workshop or anything like that, but not too bad. Uh, but what I did like about the results here is that the analysts that answered this came from a huge variety of, or a good swath of sectors. We captured a great deal of experience levels and a huge number of roles. Um, and I've tried to kind of distill all this down. What, what you're seeing here is by sector, um, what kind of experience did we capture? So from left to right, it's least experience to most, and it's a pretty good swath. Um, and, and we also captured people from the private sector, from academia, uh, nonprofit organizations. There are a few people from UN organizations that responded, which were really cool, K through 12 education. And if we want to just look at experience levels, I was pretty impressed that we've got you know, almost the same number of people that are just entering the field as people at the top who have been here for 20 or more years and have a ton of experience to provide for us. Um, so I was pretty happy with that swath, and I, I promised bar charts, so there's a bar chart, if that helps you kind of look at the distribution of experience levels of people who answered this um, poll. I should have also said at the beginning that I make no claims about the statistical validity of, validity of this poll. Uh, these are basically my Twitter people, so. <laughs> okay, so what kind of jobs do people have that filled this out? Um, there was a huge list, and I tried to kind of recode it into a smaller list. So we've got everybody from academic researchers, GIS techs, software engineers, data scientists, people who are in management. We had a couple of CTOs answer, uh, students, remote sensing scientists, educators, some statisticians. I don't even know any statisticians, so this is cool. That this, this survey went out a little broader than the, the people that I know. Um, and so in this graph, we're looking at a cut of by role who's using scripting. And there's not too much surprising here. Almost everybody is. Um, I'm a little surprised at the GIS tech people. There's kind of a bigger group of them who are not coding just yet, and we'll take a look at what they are doing. Um, just another, this is not a pie chart. I just got sick of bar charts. I'm feeling a little defensive. Um, yeah, so this is just another look at the way people tackle their work. Um, 
60 of the participants don't code at all. Uh, 91 said they do, but they don't use R. And the biggest chunk, and again, these are people that I follow or follow me on Twitter, so there's a lot of R users. Um, but a bunch of us said we, do, we either do currently code in R or we have in the past coded in R. So what other tools are we using, though? And this is super interesting to me. Um, for analysis, so I did two cuts, analysis and cartography, because there's a huge complaint among R users or among geospatial analysts that R is difficult for making maps. So I wanted to find out what, what they are doing. Um, but for analysis, QGIS, which is awesome. I don't know if you guys know QGIS. But it's an open source geospatial software program, GUI, point and click. Really powerful, tons of contributors. It's a really great program. I use it a lot for mapping um, and just for visualizing my data. And so that's sitting at the top of the stack, which was a little bit surprising to me. Uh, the biggest competitor there is Esri, and they're a few spots down. So um, they are a proprietary software company, huge uh, company. Many of you who are in spatial analysis will know who they are. Um, and then there's Python and R, and they're kind of close together. But we have got some other things. Some people are just natively using GDAL in the command line, so that's great. Um, Postgres, PostGIS, uh, Google Earth Engine made the list, so this is all good info. Um, things get a little more compressed when we start looking at cartography tools. Here we have uh, two GUIs up at the top, and this is not surprising. We've got QGIS up there, again, as well as Esri. And then the third one down, as we start getting into programming languages, is R, and I think you know, that's a tribute to all the work that's gone into making R such a good programming language for visualization and all the contrib uh, package contributions to that end. Okay, so I strayed from a bar chart. I have to take a time out here. <laughs> so um, because I'm not good at making maps in R, I pulled my Twitter friends and was like, help me out here, guys. Send me some cool maps, which you'll see later in the presentation. Um, but then I heard about this thing called Tidy Tuesday, which a lot of you may know about, but if you don't, you should check it out. People in this, this community are amazing. They get a data set every week, and they make amazing visualizations with it, and they often post their code, so I stole someone's code here, kind of, uh, to visualize by role what tools are people using. So what you're seeing here, uh, the percentages are based on the number of people in that category that filled out the poll generally. And then the circles, I know you probably can't read the labels, but you can check my slides later. Um, but the circles represent how popular that particular tool is within that group. So um, you can see that, like, uh, let's see. For data science, R and Python are pretty huge tools. Um, but in the developer community, not so much R. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But this graph just kind of tries to put all the data in front of you in a visualization that asks who are we talking about and what are they using for tools. OK, so of the people who do program, so I've filtered out the, the folks who aren't programming here, how many of them have used R or do you currently do you use R? Um, and so not surprisingly here, researchers and data scientists are heavy R users. We already know this. And uh, this is a conversation that I've heard a lot here and seen a million blog posts about. But developers are kind of uh, not so open to R in a lot of cases. Um, and so I. I did actually do some interviews with some people on my team that are developers um, and elsewhere, and we'll get into some of their feedback um, in a few minutes. But this is kind of obvious. If you're not using R, what are you doing? You're using Python. Um, so these are people who have never used R, um, and they are basically using Python or JavaScript. OK, so this question. <laughs> basically asks, you know, what's missing for R to make a huge impact or a much bigger impact in the geospatial community? And so some of this is a little tough to hear, and some of it feels a little bit inaccurate after some of the talks that I've been to about 
development pipelines and everything, but it does give us some good feedback about what the like general community is still thinking about R. Um, and if, it, if it's not correct, then we need to figure out how to change the culture and change people's um, thoughts about this. Um, so I'll just kind of read through these. These are quotes that either came off the survey or came from me speaking to people. Um, but basically, uh, one person said that the number one limitation is that no developers know R. Obviously, that's not totally true. But I think in the general community, um, you know, hiring good developers is hard, finding good developers is hard, and then making R a requirement for that makes it even, well, impossible, according to this person. Um, and then we get into like the Python versus R thing, which wasn't the question that I asked, but it's sort of inevitable. Uh, Python is the golden nugget, which has managed to bring together scientists and developers. Uh, this next person said, R is a niche scripting language. Python basically dives deeper into data science than R dives into development. A um, Couple more. Uh, there were a lot of comments about scaling up um, and resource use and the ability to control resources and memory. Um, kind of another R versus Python. And then a, a comment about maps. There were a couple comments about making maps, and this didn't have to do with Python, so that was nice change. Uh, but basically saying that people are still sort of using the GUI softwares to do their visualizations. They can pan and zoom around, and it's a little more interactive than uh, natively trying to use R. So getting on to better news. Uh, where does R shine? See what I did there? Shiny. Uh, <laughs> um, so I was obviously polling geospatial analysts, so the number one response here is geospatial analysis. That's what people are doing with R, and that's what they think our strengths are. There are a number of awesome packages for handling spatial data, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, second here was visualization. No surprise there, R is very good at that. Uh, data wrangling. I probably could have combined statistics and exploratory data analysis, but I didn't. Uh, modeling, and some people said everything. Complete pipeline, so that was cool. Um, and a couple other responses there. Favorite packages for Geo. Uh, this is more just for like your information. If you're not using uh, R for Geo, these are some really nice packages that you might want to start using. Um, the biggest responses were SF and Raster, um, which now play nicely together, so that's awesome. Also, ggplot, map view, which I don't even know what that is. Um, so some of these were helpful for me, for me as well to check out. Um, leaflet, tmap, rgdel, sp is still on there. A lot of people still are using that. Um, oh, some people put Python libraries in there. That's why GeoPandas has a little star next to it. That's not an R package. I just like hell bent on getting Python in here, but I didn't want to ignore it. So um, this is just kind of some packages that surprised me or that I didn't know what they were. Um, you know, you kind of get in your own little tunnel of working and you use the packages that you always use because they work and you kind of don't know what else is going on. So this survey introduced me to a few different ones like STARS. I do tons of spatio, uh, spatial temporal analysis and I didn't even know about this package. So i um, very excited to check that out. Uh, MapDeck, whose author I think is here. Um, just learned about that because I asked for maps on Twitter and he responded, so that's awesome. And he had a great, uh, David Cooley had a great uh, poster session last night. Um, Geosphere, I had never heard of that again. Um, Ray Shader, which I'll show you some examples from that in a minute, but makes like amazing 2D and 3D graphics, not just maps, but uh, including maps. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so I had never used that either because I don't usually make maps in R, but I'm going to now. Um, okay, so I've got some eye candy here. I'm not going to like go through these and explain all, what they are because I don't always even know what they are, but here are some uh, cool maps from Ray Shader. Um, I 
put the name of the author and the code. So these are people that responded to my Twitter call for help. Um, and there were a lot of responses to choose from. And I decided that I would narrow it down by just including people that included their code. So code's all there. Um, this one I love. It's a bivariate plot. Um, and I won't, I, it's annotated very nicely so that you can see what the colors mean. But basically, combinations of different colors reveal information about two different variables. So um, income inequality and um, high and low income. So the higher the income and the higher the inequality, we're looking at like this deep purple color down here. So you can see these areas have uh, people with high income and the inequality is also super high. And that's just kind of how you explain these. But like, what a beautiful map. I don't even think I could make that ever in any software. So um, this one's super cool, too. Uh, this person had to make an orienteering map. And they decided to do it in Lord of the Rings uh, theme. And they just like made this up in R. Uh, code available. And then there's a couple other examples that are just like really nice, pretty maps that you can make with R um, from some very cool, uh, very active people in the, especially that Tidy Tuesday Twitter group. This one looks like stained glass, which is pretty cool. Uh, this one's from Map Deck. I don't know how that got in there again, but I worked really hard on that graphic. Just wanted to get a little more mileage out of it. Um, yeah, I, I really thought, I don't know, I worked really hard and I stole people's code and I patched it together and it was like two in the morning. Uh, so don't judge my code if you do look at it. It's really hard to put your code out there. Um, anyway, I'm happy to take questions or discussion about some of the things that were found from the survey. Um, Terrific. Thank you. Once again, if you'd like to submit a question, use the app app.sli.do. We've got a couple questions for you. Any best practices on mapping zip code data? Can you talk a little bit about the data processing component? What's the ideal stage that data should get to? Whoa. Um, I have to say I've never mapped zip code data. So I don't know if I'm the best person to to answer that, um, and I, what was the second part of the? Um, can you talk about the data processing component? Hard to know. What's the ideal stage that data should get to? I guess it's sort of like any other data science situation where you have to do a lot of uh, pre-processing and cleaning of your data to get it to a stage where it's actually useful. And I don't think, oftentimes, you know, geospatial data seems like this big magical thing. It's not. It's there are certain things you have to know that are specific to it, but other than, other than that, it's just another data science problem. How many of the people who made complaints about R do you believe have used the most recent geospatial packages, like SF? Yeah, probably not many. Um, a lot of them, so you know, there's this tension even in, in my group, and this is part of what prompted me to do this, um, where the data science team, we are writing in Python and or R, but the engineering team is like, I only want Python, and they don't know R, and they won't look at R. So probably not many. They just have this thought about what it is based on stuff they've heard um, and probably heard a long time ago. So yeah, that's. I think we have time for one more question. What about um, Julia, the language Julia for geospatial? Yeah. Um, you know, no, but so on this graph and on some of the other graphs, I took like the top responses. So on this one, 10 people or more had to say it, that they were using it. Um, Julia did appear, but I think it was one person. Um, I have not coded in Julia, but um, I mean, I've heard, I've heard good things, but I, I don't have the experience to, to awesome. say. Awesome. Well, thank you. And thank uh, you. Please, uh, please thank uh, Tina Cormier from Indigo.